Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Now is the time to trim your lamps and get ready for the coming of the Lord. Stay tuned for the Midnight Cry broadcast. Good Lord. He fills it all. He's aware every moment of every, not just atom, but every subatomic particle that they'll ever discover. He's aware of it fully all the time, instantly. I mean, that's an amazing God. He brings princes to naught, to nothing. Reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground that he blows on them and they wither and a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. Well, one thing that tells me is if you've got somebody who's really puffed up and ruling and, and just making a lot of proud noise in this world, it's because God is allowing it. It's not because God has, is sitting there having an emergency council in heaven trying to figure out what to do. He knows exactly and he is allowing Satan to hang himself. He is allowing what is happening in our world and he simply wants his people to be aware and not to be, not to be uh, hindered by it, not to be sh uh, shut down because of what is happening. Praise the Lord. None of this is a problem to him. To whom will you compare me or who is my equal, says the Holy One. Lift your eyes. Look to the heavens. Who created all these? And where did it come from? Not a big bang, I'll tell you. It's a big God. He didn't need a big bang. He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls them each by name. You know, we've talked about this before. It's, it's you know, one thing to think about a few thousand visible stars, but when you start thinking of in the order of trillions, that's a pretty good language to have that many words. Wow. For him to know every single one, know its orbit, know where it's at, keep it, keep an orderly, and yet to be able to come down to the end and, and say, time shall be no more, and boom, he can just dissolve it that quick. I'll tell you what. I want to live for his purpose. I want to be his. Praise God. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. So now he's addressing the people, of course, who tended to look, as we all do, at their circumstances and at the world that they had to live in every single day. And it wasn't just that there were heathen emperors out there doing bad stuff. They had one on the throne in Jerusalem. And he was a wicked man, an idolater. Thumbed his nose at God throughout his whole, almost his whole life. He sort of humbled himself a little bit at the end, but I mean, he was the one that just, the die was cast by him, by his reign. And uh, it just, you know, it, it's just horrible. Why do you say, O oh, Jacob, and complain Oh, Israel. Of course, none of us would ever complain, would we, actually? We certainly matured beyond having anything negative to say or to think or, or self-pity. I mean, of course, we've all grown beyond that, haven't we? Self-indulgence, all the little things that kind of go along with feeling the weight of stuff, feeling our weakness, feeling, looking around and feeling a sense of futility and and, and all the things that we tend to feel as being, living as a part of this world, none of us would ever experience that, right? But you know, I, I, we have a Heavenly Father who understands, and that's why He sent a word. It wasn't a word of condemnation. It sure was a, wo a word of waking up, and realizing how things really are. But it wasn't like, you know, coming down with a mailed fist. This is coming down with... I'm a shepherd. I want to carry you in my arms if that's what's needed. I love you. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. There's something about the way God's purpose is being worked out in our lives where we have 
to go through things where it looks like God isn't, doesn't care and he's not involved. It's, a, it's an amazing balance that only the wisdom of God could pull off. Where God comes and he helps me and I'm aware of it, but I don't, but, but if, I, if, if he goes that direction too long, I'm going to become complacent, am I not? I'm going to become careless, presumptuous. Hey, I can do it, do what I want. God's always going to pick up the pieces. How would I ever grow up if God did not let me feel what this world is really like, what life is really like, if he didn't let me sow and reap some of the things, some of the bad decisions I made, if he didn't let me feel my weakness, what would I do? I would lean on it in a heartbeat. We do it without thinking. We think we can do stuff. But not when it comes to things that matter, things that are eternal. We need God. We need him like we need our next breath. Oh, how wise he is. He can ride to our rescue when it's the right thing to do, but he can let us experience the, the full weight of our weakness and uh, sometimes our failures and, some, and all those things. We need to know why we need him. Yeah. And there's no way that we'll ever know that without being some, someplace that's, you know, where we feel those things. I mean, you think about the, uh, the prodigal son. What did it take? And we say, Lord, do whatever it takes. Well, in his case, what it took is getting in a hog pen. But are we different? No. In our, in our Christian lives, we, there's stuff that I know by theory, but I'll, I'll tell you what, God has to do stuff. He has to let things happen. He has to let me feel my weakness and my infirmity. Didn't he do that for Paul? Sure he did. Because Paul wanted to serve God, but God saw something in his, in his zeal. His, and zeal brings with it a self-confidence. We tend to run in our own strength. Think what he told Peter, you know, when you were young. You girded yourself. You went where you wanted to go. Your zeal fired and powered what you did. And you thought you were serving me. And it wasn't, it was just you. When you're old. You'll stretch forth your hand and another will gird you. Another's going to give you what it takes. It's a way of, a way of saying that. And, and carry you to places you don't want to go. I mean, it's going, it's going to be against our human nature, but it's going to be right. It's the only way that leads home. And that's the way I want to go. But I'll tell you, God has to allow these things. Has he allowed any of that in your life? Has he allowed your way to get hard and get get difficult and maybe even discouraging and, and just and you, suddenly you're, you're weak and you know the pressures of life the pressures of this world we need to realize part of waking up to what's going on in the world is feeling the pressure that just kind of hangs in the air sometime i mean not all the time it hangs there all the time we need to know the kind of a world we're up against so that we won't bop along and think, hey, we got it nailed, we know what to do, we just come and do, you know, practice our little religion, and everything's cool, and we need him. We need a relationship with him, we need to come to places where we feel all of that, so we will turn to him and say, oh God, I need you, help me. Do you not know, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. That's amazing. You know, we get all kinds of physical laws that you can't invent energy, you can't create energy. But here he is. Do you think that when he gives us strength, it somehow diminishes him? Like, I'm, like he's going to run out and he's got to go plug in somewhere? No, he is the source of all energy, all strength, all of everything. We never are without a source of what we need. Praise God. Praise God. Doesn't get tired. I can't imagine that. Lord have mercy. 
His understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Oh, praise God. You know, I was just thinking about this. He goes on, he says, even youths grow weary, tired and weary. Young men stumble and fall. Why is it that we get weary? I mean, I understand that we can get physically tired at, under the best of circumstances. But I'm talking about more than just a physical weariness. I'm talking when it begins to weigh on our hearts and our minds and our spirits. And we begin to kind of coast, give in, just kind of float along. And we're not really engaged but much. We're just feeling, that, oh, we're just... And then, of course, the devil comes and he begins to tempt us with this and push us in that direction, and we go, we go the way of least resistance. Why do we do that? I mean, why, why does that happen? Exactly. We're running in our own strength. And I'll tell you, the Lord can explain it till he's blue in the face. But the only way we ever get that is when we have to face it and look in the mirror and say, Lord, I did it again. Lord, I'm running in my own strength. Once again, you're showing me that I'm not, I'm not up to this. The Christian life is totally impossible for me. But your plan is not for me to try to live for you and earn acceptance. It's to come at the cross and lay down my burden and give you my heart and lay it down and just, just open up my heart and, and have you give me a new heart and a new strength. But even then, I got to learn how to live in that. Amen. Because I just, I'm like Peter. Lord, I'll never deny you. Seriously? I'll, though everybody denies you, I won't. I'll lay down my life for you. What did Jesus say? Of course, he told him to pray. He says the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And of course, the flesh is strong to do its thing in the world, but it's weak when it comes to the things of God. It's awful easy for us to, to say the right thing, and then when we're standing there and, and we're trying to draw on the, on the resources of self and <laughs> throw up our hands, we have no strength against, against this world. You know, it's one thing to live among men and, and, and be a person of accomplishment and feel like, hey, I can, you know, I'm stronger, I'm better, I'm wiser, I can, I've got the willpower, I've got all the, the human attributes that enable me to be a success in the world. All of that is worthless. I'll tell you, when God calls somebody into his kingdom, he doesn't call many of those kinds of people. And when he does, he's got a big job on his hands to get, to get them to unlearn all that and to realize I have one thing. He wants to live in me. He will use attributes that he has put into my character, but they will not be fueled by me. Because I'll tell you, anything we fuel, that we, we inject our energy into it, and it's really from us, it tends to be for us, doesn't it? It's not really for him. It's really for us. And who deserves the glory? And I'll tell you, Think about what he said to Peter about being old. And, you know, Brother Thomas used to say, yes, what he means is mature. But a lot of times, old in, eight, in years tends to go along with that, doesn't it? I could see some gray heads going. <laughs> because we thought we were pretty cool stuff when we were young, didn't we? Man, we lay hold of this new revelation and we're going to run with it. We're going to change the world. And... God needs to change us. But isn't he faithful to do it? And I'm so thankful he doesn't do it with this angry fist. He does it like that shepherd. Oh, praise God. So if you're one who's feeling a lot of that tiredness and weariness, not necessarily just in body, but, in, but it's, it's begun to affect your spirit, you're not alone. This is a common condition among men. But oh, how the Lord's heart would reach out to lift our eyes so we don't get bogged down and held up and defeated and just stay in this state 
of, of depression or whatever it is that, that tends to lead to. We can rise up in our hearts and look to him who never runs out of strength. And he promises it. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Uh, I, I've seen at least three different ways that word hope is translated. Obviously in the King James, those who wait on the Lord. This, who, those who hope on the Lord. I think the NLT has those who trust in the Lord. There's a richness to the meaning of the original. It's not simply wait in the sense of time, though sometimes time may be involved. It is an expectation. Hope is more than, boy, I hope he helps me here. It's not this wish, baseless wish. This is a hope that is based upon his revealed character and his promises. And even when time is involved, we're talking about a God who has given us a certainty why, why did he say earlier that men and all that they do, I can blow them away like this, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Why would we trust in what we see rather than what he says? But learning that is another story, and that's, that's what life is about, is learning how to, to repose our trust in what he has said. But his promise here is those who hope, those who come to him, Lord, you are the one I am depending on. You have brought me yet again to a place where I feel my need. Lord, I do not have what it takes. But of course, you know that. And that's why Jesus died, and that's why he rose. That's why the life that was in him is in me, because I put my trust in you. Oh, I'm looking to you right now. I need a fresh touch. I need you to come and help me. I need you to lift my spirits to help me not to, not to reckon on what I feel and what I am and what I see, but to reckon on your faithfulness. Those who hope, there's an expectation. How many of you find that when you think about finding hope in the Lord and in situations where you feel kind of down, find that a challenge? You find the devil tries to undermine that sense of hope like, Look at you, look what you did, look what you are. He's disgusted with you. Why should you have any reason to put your trust in him? Why should he help you? Well, what are you looking at? Looking at you? God looked at you too. And he sent his son to the cross to take care of that. Praise God. Praise God. He has given us every reason to push through all of the lies, all the weakness, to run to him, not because we deserve it, but because we need him and because his promise is real. And that's what I want to lean on with all my heart. Praise God. And you know, a lot of, of our being, will, being able to be really used of him has everything to do with learning that we cannot do in ourselves, learning how to let go and to humble ourselves to the reality that without him we can do nothing. And more than just a resignation to that fact, you could sort of resign yourself to that and it'd be almost with an air of resentment. Yeah, I know it's true, but I don't like it. But you know there's a place that God wants to bring us to where we can rejoice that it's that way. And because we see with different eyes than the world sees, we see where this is all going. And we know that he's, he's not crushing us to destroy us. He's, take, he's, sep, he's separating us, he's delivering us from what we are in ourselves so that we can have him. Yeah. And it's so much better. You know, I, I picked up on something. We listened to Jim Simbel, the message uh, the other night. He was talking about... Um, unusual thanks, I think it was something like that. And at one point he, he went to the cross and he went to the Last Supper and Jesus giving thanks for the, and said, this is my body which is broken for you. And he kind of hinted at the, what, what jumped out at me, but he went on to, to our being thankful for what he did. Well, praise God, that's right, obviously. But I never really noticed 
the implications of what Jesus did. Here he is holding up bread, holding up wine. And he's telling them what that represented. This is my flesh. This is my body. This is my blood. And what does he do? He says, thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you that I get to go to the cross. Thank you. I see what this world is. I see where this is going. Thank you that I have the privilege of giving up all of this so that I can accomplish that for them. Thank you. God, are we selfish? We don't want to die. But when the Lord is looking to bring us to that place that he has for us where we're, we look to him and we see with his eyes more than, more than we do now, I'll tell you, one of the marks of really getting that is when we can say thank you. Paul gloried in his weakness, didn't he? He didn't tolerate it and resent it. He gloried in it. Why? Because God had given him a heart to say, I, my calling is to help them. It's not for me, it's for them. Oh, they were warning him, don't go to Jerusalem. He said, why are you trying to break my heart? I'm ready to die. For me, to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Hey, that's, that, takes some, that takes some experience with God. But here's the heart of God saying, look how great I am, but look how tender I am. Look how ready I am to lift you up and to help you and to encourage you. But I don't want you just, I don't want you to do it resentfully. I want you to come to me with a thankful heart. And I don't want you just to know about this. I want you to experience me. The only way I can experience the greatness of what he's talking about here is to be in a place where I feel what he's describing, where I have run out of gas and the devil is pouring it on and saying, it's no use, just go, to, go indulge yourself, go, you know, just go into a funk. None of you would ever do that. And instead, we, we learn to lift up our eyes and say, oh God, now is the time for me to experience what you promised. This needs to become personal. Does that mean he's going to come and we're going to feel exhilarated? No. I'll tell you what, we can still have a peace and a strength and a steadiness on the inside, even when we continue to feel outward weakness. Sometimes he can, yeah, he can make us like Arnold Schwarzenegger if he wants to. But... What the strength that I need is the strength to simply put one foot in front of another and say God's word is real. God is, God is true. He's with me. He loves me. It's worth everything to serve him. And I'll tell you, when we do that, there's a peace that we sung about earlier. And it's not just a peace that keeps us now. It's one that's going to take us all the way through because it's not us that's doing it. It's him from front to finish. Praise God. What an awesome Savior. What an awesome God we serve. So if you're in that place today where you feel, oh God, I'm tired, I'm weak, I'm weary. The battle just seems endless and I'm so tired and my spirit is flagging. God has the answer for you. He hasn't called you to run in your own strength. He's called you to lean upon him and to spend time with him and look to him. And he's promised to be there and to give you what you need. Praise him. Praise the Lord. This has been the Midnight Cry broadcast. If you would like a DVD or CD of today's message in its entirety, please request it by program number. While it is not required, a donation of $10 for DVDs and $5 for CDs is suggested to help with expenses. Also, for those who request it, we will send you our quarterly publication, The Midnight Cry Messenger, free and postage paid. Send your requests to Midnight Cry Ministries, Post Office Box 685, Southern Pines, North Carolina, 28388.
We invite you to join us again next week at the same time. And may God richly bless you until then.